so today is the fifth problem solving session for the course experimental biotechnology so till now we have discussed about uh, different electrophoresis techniques and then we in the previous class we discussed about the chromatography the basics of chromatography and uh, we had discussed about uh, ion exchange and hydrophobic interaction chromatography right so today we will uh, start with another technique called gel filtration chromatography so it is another type of chromatography so we will discuss all the questions that are uh, related to that topic and that will help you to solve your assignment as well uh, feel free to ask any questions at any point whenever you like uh, and if you have any kind of doubt uh, you can either write into the chat box or you can unmute your mic and ask okay so let's start with the first question okay let's start with the first question now question number 1 gel filtration chromatography separates protein based on their dash option a charge option b size option c hydrophobicity and option d affinity so whoever knows the answer can write in the chat box we already have one answer from shahina option b size okay anyone else wants to answer okay so correct answer is option b okay yeah we have more people agreeing to that so the correct answer is option b so gel filtration chromatography is a technique in which we can separate molecules based on their size so if you remember from the previous class we studied about ion exchange chromatography ion exchange chromatography uh, was separating molecules based on their charge right hydrophobic interaction chromatography was separating molecules based on their hydrophobicity similarly gel filtration chromatography uh utilizes the property that is size or molecular weight we can say to separate different proteins uh, or different molecules from each other okay so this is just a general uh representation of how gel filtration chromatography works so it is basically packed with porous uh stationary phase material okay so uh it is generally packed with gel based material which has small pores so all these large particles that you are seeing gel part labeled as gel particles basically these particles have pores in it okay and now these pore sizes can differ so whatever the pore size of the column will be of these gel particle will be based on that our separation between different molecules will occur okay so imagine just uh sorry so just imagine a a bead like that in which we have different pores okay and similar many beads are packed into a hollow cylindrical column right so now what is happening in these pores some molecules can fit and some cannot right so here i have mixture of molecules some are bigger in size some are smaller in size okay so what will happen the smaller particles that can enter the col uh, enter the pore they will sit inside the pore ma'am sorry for the disturbance ma'am yeah. question not display ma'am sorry what question not display ma'am just I, we i'm discussing about the first question only gel filtration okay. chromatography okay okay ma'am yeah so i'm just explaining how it uh, how gel filtration chromatography utilizes uh, the size as the property to separate molecules from each other okay so how the how the molecules are being separated based on their sizes that is happening because these gel particles they have pores of different sizes okay now whatever size i am choosing based on that i can uh separate different range of molecule uh, basically i can separate a particular 
size range of molecules okay so now if you see here in the sample i have mixture of large molecules and small molecules large proteins and small proteins as labeled here so uh, the pores that are there in the gel particle the small particle can uh, the small protein can fit in this pore but the large protein cannot enter the pore so what will happen as a result you see here in this figure the large uh, protein will pass without entering any pore it will just pass through the space between the gel particles that we call as the void volume okay so the part that are not occupied by the gel particles is the void volume of the column and the large particles since they cannot enter the pore they will just escape the column from this uh, inter gel spaces okay but the small molecule the small protein that can enter the gel particle what will happen they will enter so smaller the protein is it can enter more and more gel particles so what will happen it will take a longer route to travel before it comes out of the column so as a result what happens larger molecules will elute first as you can see here larger molecules are eluting first and the smaller molecules will elute last okay so we will have the separation like we will get the largest molecule first then smaller than that then smaller than that and so on okay so this is how we get the different mixture of proteins separated from each other based on sizes okay i hope this uh, principle behind gel filtration chromatography is clear because all the questions uh from now on is based on gel filtration chromatography so until on this you understand the uh principle behind this it will be difficult for you to solve the next questions upcoming questions so is the principle behind gel filtration chromatography clear to everyone If you want I can explain again. <coughs> okay, I hope the principle is clear. so basically the separation is based on sizes the larger molecule will elute first the smaller molecule will elute later <coughs> i'm sorry just give me a minute okay moving on to next question question number 2 the total volume of a gel is equal to sum of dash option a pore volume void volume and elution volume option b pore volume protein injection volume void volume option c protein injection volume void volume elution volume and option d pore volume void volume protein injection volume anybody knows the answer okay option a we have two people answering option a okay anyone else wants to answer so option a means pore volume void volume and elution volume total volume of gel is equal to the sum of <coughs> So the correct answer is option A pore volume void volume and elution volume so let's see what these uh mean so pore volume basically as i told you we have the gel particle we have pores in it so the volume of the pore okay the volume inside the pore that is the pore volume elution volume would be the 
volume of the mobile phase buffer that is required to completely elute the smallest molecule possible from the gel filtration column okay and the void volume is what i explained in the previous slide if you remember the spaces between the uh, gel particles that are not actually participating in separation or that are not actually part of the gel filtration okay Ge the gel filtration process is happening through the gel particles right so the portion of the column portion inside the column that are not part of those uh, gel particles are basically the void volume of the column okay so we have the total volume of the column equal to the gel uh, volume of the gel volume of the pore and void volume okay so this is the total column volume is this clear to everyone so basically if we take let's say i take 10 ml of gel okay i resuspend the gel i swell it up and then i will pour it into the column and pack it tightly to make a gel filtration column for doing chromatography right so the gel volume will be 10 ml but the total column volume will increase because of these void volume and because of the pore wall because the, now the gel particle has swollen up so it will occupy some volume on its own then those gel particles are packed together so there are some inter gel spaces that are there that are, that is the void volume then the pore volume that the gel has now swollen up so the pores will also occupy some volume so the total column volume will be dependent on the gel volume pore volume and the void volume okay so total column volume is different from the actual gel particles that you are taking if i am taking 10 ml of gel doesn't mean that my column volume will be 10 ml okay the column volume will be higher than that because the gels will now swell up and swell up and uh, they will occupy more volume okay is this question clear to everyone any doubt anybody has any doubt no ma'am no ma'am ma'am is uh, elution volume and volume of gel matrix both terminology same uh, not exactly so uh, Elution volume uh, will be related to uh, uh, your distribution coefficient. coefficient. So uh, I'll discuss uh, in the next question, so you will understand it better. Okay. But in the quest answer, A was correct. Yes. yes but yes. it is written elution volume, and uh, in the discussion part, VG is. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, basically, VG again can be written in terms of elution volume. So. Ultimately, you will get the total uh, volume of the column as elution volume, pore volume, and void volume. So VG can be written as written in terms of uh, elution volume and the distribution coefficient. Okay. okay. So elution okay. volume and distribution coefficient are actually linearly related to each other. So okay. we'll discuss in the next question, so it will be more clear. Uh, okay. 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 Okay, moving on to the next question, question number 3. Given below are KD values of different proteins. First is protein A, KD value is equal to 0.5. Second is protein B, KD is equal to 0 0.8. Third is protein C, KD is equal to 0 0.3. And fourth is protein D, KD is equal to 1. From the options given below, Choose the correct order of elution of these proteins from the GFC column, from the gel filtration chromatography column. So, we have four different proteins and their respective distribution coefficients are given. 
so from the previous class also if you remember the distribution coefficient relation with the stationary phase and the mobile phase you will understand how the proteins are going to elute so tell me in which order the proteins will elute Okay, we have one answer option C, one answer option two answers are as option D. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, again option D. So let's check uh the kd values first so if you remember from the previous session also distribution coefficient the higher the distribution coefficient the, the higher the kd value that means it is interacting more with the stationary phase that means it will elute last right so the le least kd will elute first so here what we have is protein c 0.3 so 3 will elute first then we will have 0 0.5 that is 1 then we will have 0 0.8 that is 2 and then we will have 1 that is 4 so option c is the correct answer so only shahina gave the correct answer here all of you who are answering option d you are basically answering the opposite of what uh, the correct answers so uh, basically what ha what is happening in gel filtration column I told you that the smallest protein will elute last and the largest protein is will elute first right now here the KD value doesn't represent its molecular weight KD is representing the distribution coefficient between the stationary and the mobile phase okay so if I say a protein has KD 0 0.3 and another protein has KD 1, that doesn't mean that the protein with KD equivalent to 0 0.3 is uh, the smaller protein. Okay. It just means that it is interacting less with the stationary phase than the protein that has a higher KD value. Okay. So, the proteins that have the highest KD value, that means it is actually interacting with the stationary phase the most that means this protein might be the smallest of all those four proteins that are given and that protein is actually traveling through each gel particle so here the stationary phase is our gel particle the porous gel particle is our stationary phase right so the protein that will interact with those gel particle the most will have the highest kd value and the protein that will interact the least with those gel particle will have the lowest kd value okay so if kd is equal to zero that means it is not interacting with the stationary phase at all that means that protein is actually eluting out from the void volume so do you understand everyone who are answering option d do you understand the uh, meaning of distribution coefficient here okay okay great so this is not representing the molecular weight this is actually representing the distribution coefficient okay so that means how much a molecule is interacting with the stationary phase okay and this is actually true for all types of chromatography not just gel filtration chromatography if i have ion exchange chromatography and I give you the KD values in that also the elution will happen according to the increasing order of KD values. So the least, uh, so the molecule having the least uh, value for KD will elute first, molecule with the highest KD will elute last. Any type of chromatography whether it is an affinity chromatography, any form of interaction chromatography or any form of interaction based separation this rule is constant for all chromatographic techniques okay all separation based techniques basically anyone have any doubt 
I hope this is clear, right? Let's move on to the next question, question number 4. Distribution coefficient that is KD in gel filtration chromatography is independent of Option A, void volume, option B, elution volume, option C, column length and option D, pore volume. So, this distribution chromatography in gel filtration, sorry, just distribution coefficient in gel filtration chromatography is independent of what? Option A, void volume, option B, elution volume, option C, column length and option D, pore volume. Anybody wants to answer? Option C. Okay. So, everybody seems to agree with option C. So, that is the correct answer. Column length. So, distribution coefficient. Now, you have understood what distribution coefficient means, right? So, it is basically the interaction of a molecule with the stationary phase and mobile phase. The ratio of its interaction with stationary phase versus mobile phase. Okay, that is the simplest layman, lang, uh, layman uh, definition of distribution coefficient. Okay, I hope that is clear. So, now think, if you no, don't know the formula or anything, now think of it in this way. You have a column, like in this chromatographic technique, the separation is based on size. You have some porous beads, it's like a sieve, and you are basically separating the molecules through those sieves. So, the smaller is getting separated from the larger ones. Okay. Now, if I ask you how the distribution coefficient, how the distribution of two molecules, the smaller and the larger molecules will differ. Think of it logically. Void volume will affect because if the void volume is larger, what will happen? Many, uh, like if the void volume is very large, we will not be able to separate between the large proteins that will not fit into the pore that will actually elute from the void volume. So, within those proteins, we will not be able to dis, uh, differentiate. So, to differentiate between those proteins, we need a column with a pore size of that particular size range. Okay. So, void volume will affect the distribution coefficient. Then comes the elution volume. Again, elution volume, void volume, pore volume, these things are anywhere related to the total column volume. So, any factor if you change, the total column volume is going to change and your separation is going to change. The only factor that won't change is column length. Why? Because if I increase the col column length, let's say I took 10 ml of beads and then I uh, pack the column with it and including the void volume and everything the column volume became 15 or 20 ml like I am just giving rough numbers now what if I take 20 ml of beads and the column becomes 30 ml the ratio will ratio of separation between two molecules like between the molecule uh, in the stationary phase and the mobile phase that ratio is going to increase uh, proportionally like that those values are going to increase proportionally so the ratio is going to be same so that's why distribution coefficient is going to remain same irrespective of the column length okay column length is not going to actually affect the uh, distribution coefficient volumes column volume void volume elution volume these can actually affect the now if i pack the 20 ml column in a uh, 50 centimeter column, 50 centimeter cylindrical tube or if I pack those same 20 ml column, uh, 20 ml beads in a, in another 100 centimeter, uh, like a thinner column which is taller in uh, length. So, that will not affect the volume factors. So, that will not affect ultimately the distribution coefficient. So, this is actually the formula for distribution coefficient elution volume minus the void volume divided by the uh, pore volume okay so any doubt in the previous question
let's move on to the next question question number 5 if distribution coefficient kd is greater than 1 then option a protein is diluted first from the column option b protein is adsorbed on the beads and will not dilute option c protein is diluted completely from the column and option d protein will enter the column uh, and protein will enter completely into the pore and elute last if distribution coefficient kd is greater than 1 then protein is diluted first from the column protein is adsorbed on the beads and will not elute protein is eluted completely from the column and option d protein will enter completely into the pore and elute last so we have one answer from tanisha protein is adsorbed on the beads and will not elute okay anyone else wants to answer protein is eluted completely from the column okay we have two different answers now anybody else wants to break the tie so if you remember i just showed you the formula for kd right the formula for kd was elution volume minus the void volume divided by the pore volume now it's a ratio okay so think of it in this way kd can either be less than 1 it can be 0 or it can be greater than 1 those are the three possibilities if it is less than 1 that means the if it is less than 1 that means the numerator is less than the denominator that means this factor ve minus vo is less than vi if it is equal to 0 that means ve minus vo is 0 and if it is greater than 1 that means ve minus vo is uh greater than vi okay that is the logic behind the distribution coefficient now if i am saying that the elution volume minus the void so elution volume minus the void volume is basically the remaining volume of the column elution volume is the is part of the total volume of the column right so i told you the total volume was equivalent to elution volume plus pore volume plus uh void volume so if i subtract elution vol void volume from the elution volume that means i have only the volume of the gel if that is less than the pore volume that means the protein has entered the pores okay if it is equal to 0 that means it has not entered any pore if it is greater than 1 then what does it mean if it is greater than 1 that means the <coughs> <coughs> sorry if it is greater than 1 that means the elution volume minus void volume the numerator factor is actually greater than the denominator factor and it is actually not practically possible because if i say the <coughs> elution volume minus the void volume that is the volume of the gel is actually greater than the volume of the pore that is actually not practically possible that is only possible when the protein molecules are totally adsorbed by the column okay the protein molecules have adsorbed in the column and it is not eluting at all if it is eluting that means there is a part distribution coefficient is basically partition between the stationary and the mobile phase okay if the partitioning is happening that means something is going to elute out <coughs> if this factor is greater than 1 that means everything is adsorbed and nothing is going to elute out that is why 
the kd has exceeded the value 1 okay so the correct answer is option b protein is adsorbed on the beads and will not elute protein is adsorbed on the bead and will not elute from the column <coughs> is this clear Okay, moving on to the next question, question number 6. Choice of column in GFC depends on Option A, charge and mass of protein Option B, pressure limit of the equipment and charge of protein <coughs> Option C, pressure limit of the equipment and Option D, pressure limit of the equipment and size of protein Choice of column in gel filtration chromatography depends on what factor? <coughs> okay, I am getting option A as the answer. Okay. I am actually a little surprised. Till now we have discussed how uh, what the principle about gel filtration chromatography. Do you remember question number one? Forget about this question. If you are answering option A, then there is serious uh, doubt that you have understood the previous question. I will just go to the first question first. Do you understand this question and the answer for this question? I want answers from you guys, especially the ones who are answering option A as the correct answer. How is gel filtration chromatography uh, separating two molecules? What is the factor it is depending on? The parameter based on which gel filtration chromatography separates two molecules <coughs> that parameter is size right do you understand how gel filtration chromatography is separating two molecules based on size do you understand this principle that's why in the first question only i was when i was explaining i told you to understand this concept very clearly first because all the questions are related on gel filtration chromatography are based on gel filtration chromatography. So you guys do understand this right. So how are you answering charge and mass? What, uh, what which technique is actually used to separate molecules based on their charge? Which technique do we use to separate two molecules based on their charge? We have discussed the technique in the previous class. Yes, ion exchange chromatography. So, now tell me the answer for this question. How will you, if I, now if you know that the gel filtration chromatography is based on size, how will you choose a column to do gel filtration chromatography? You will have to look for the size of the protein. Mass of the protein was right answer, but charge has nothing to do for, with the separation of, separation in the gel filtration chromatography column okay so for a gel filtration chromatography uh, based separation mass of the protein size mainly size of the molecule is important so two proteins having the same mass 
can have different sizes based on their hydrodynamic radius. So let's say I have two proteins and both of them are of 50 kilodalton. Okay, but one protein can be very compactly packed and one protein can be some barrel shaped. <coughs> right? So one protein can be globular, spherical in shape and one protein can be barrel shaped. Now the protein that is barrel shaped obviously is occupying more space in uh, general, more hydrodynamic radius. That means when we will separate these two molecules, the barrel shaped molecule will elute first and the spherical molecule will elute later. Okay, So that means even if the mass of two proteins are similar, size can differ. Okay, size of a molecule is actually the property that is uh, used by used by the gel filtration chromatography technique. Okay, another factor that is actually important is pressure limit of the equipment. So, uh, generally we do these chromatographic techniques using an FPLC. So, you if you have watched the lecture videos, if you haven't watched, I would suggest you watch the lecture videos by Professor Vishal Trivedi first. So, if you have watched the lecture videos, you will see there is a demonstration of how gel filtration chromatography is done on an FPLC, okay, on the ACTA system, okay. So, that is an automated system in which pressure pumps are attached and we have the buffer bottles from which the lines are going and it is connected to a pressure pump. So, the buffer will be withdrawn from the bottle, passed through the column. So, and we can set the flow rate. So, whatever flow rate I am entering in the system, that with that flow rate only the buffer is going to enter the column. So, all those factors should match your column properties also. So, let's say my column can withstand a particular amount of pressure. Okay. So, whenever we pack a column, column is going to give a back pressure that you can understand from any, uh, let's say you have some uh, container with which is completely filled with some particle or some grain. Okay. So, now if you try to push it further down, it will obviously give some amount of back pressure, right? So, that back pressure should be able to, uh, like should be compatible to the equipment that you are using. So, whatever system, whatever FPLC system you are using, the equipment should be compatible to the column. So, pressure limits of the equipment is very important because if your pressure limit of the equipment is let's say uh, very less and your column is giving very high back pressure, your system will not be able to withstand that pressure, that amount of pressure. Okay, So, that is why pressure limit is very important and size of the protein is obviously important because that is the principle behind the gel filtration base separation. Okay? So, I hope everyone has understood this now, <coughs> I was surprised to see the answer charge from you guys. Charge has nothing to do with the size based separation. Okay, Charge based separation was discussed in the previous class where we discussed about ion exchange chromatography. So, from the name itself you can understand ion exchange. So, ions are being exchanged. So, that is basically a charge based separation and here we have gel filtration so it's a base it's basically a filtration based system so like you studied in sds like when we were doing electrophoresis you have studied sds space so that was also size based separation because you were just separating the molecules based on the size on a gel okay there the charge factor was coming because of the elect, uh, electric field. Okay. So, that was charge and size. In this case, we are not applying any electric field. It is just a gel matrix. So, that means it has only, it can only separate based on size. 
आई होप दिस इज क्लियर टू एवरी वन नाउ लेट्स मूव ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन क्वेश्चन नंबर सेवन विच मैट्रिक्स इज यूज फॉर प्रोटीन ऑफ थ्री हंड्रेड डाल्टन विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग मैट्रिक्स कैन बी यूज फॉर प्रोटीन फॉर सेपरेटिंग प्रोटीन्स ऑफ थ्री हंड्रेड डाल्टन लेट्स से आई हैव मिक्सचर ऑफ डिफरेंट प्रोटीन्स एंड माई प्रोटीन ऑफ इंटरेस्ट इज ऑफ इज ऑफ थ्री हंड्रेड डाल्टन सो विच मैट्रिक्स शुड आई यूज ऑप्शन ए सेफेडेक्स जी ट्वेंटी फाइव ऑप्शन बी सेफेडेक्स फोर दिस विल बी जी हंड्रेड आई एम सॉरी आई चेंज दिस ऑप्शन बी इज सेफेडेक्स जी हंड्रेड ऑप्शन सी सेफेडेक्स जी टेन एंड ऑप्शन डी सेफेडेक्स जी फिफ्टी एनी बडी नोज द आंसर ओके वी हैव वन आंसर ऑप्शन डी सेफेडेक्स जी फिफ्टी ओके एनी वन एल्स this is just knowledge based question so if you don't know the answer it's okay i'll show you the whole table where okay we have another answer option c cefedex g10 so the correct answer is actually cefedex g10 so we have different kinds of so we have different kinds of matrix cefedex g10 g25 g50 g100 and so on so these names are basically given based on the based on its fractionation range okay so if you have g10 it can only separate up to 700 dalton so in the question we had a protein of 300 dalton which is a very small protein so that can be separated using g10 if i try to separate that in g25 what will happen is so you see fractionation range of g25 is 1000 to 500 so below 1000 if i take protein of 300 and 500 and 700 together all those proteins will elute together they will not elute as separate peaks okay they will not be separated from each other so proteins below 1000 daltons will all elute together okay and proteins above 5000 dalton will go in the void volume so they will also get eluted together so on the separation that we will get can be only done between uh 1000 to 5000 daltons that is 1 kilo dalton to 5 kilo dalton similarly for g50 we have 1.5 kilo dalton to 30 kilo dalton so now the fractionation range is broader so below 1.5 kilo dalton <coughs> we won't have any separation above 30 kilo dalton we won't have any separation similarly for g100 we have 4000 daltons to 150000 daltons that is 4 kilo dalton to 150 kilo dalton okay so below 4 kilo dalton so now if i have mixture of 1 kilo dalton 3 kilo dalton i will have to use a uh, g25 column i cannot use a g100 uh, column or i cannot use g100 matrix okay so do you understand how the uh, fractionation <coughs> how the fractionation range uh, is important like before choosing your matrix you have to look for the fractionation range and the size of your protein of interest <coughs> just a minute <coughs> yeah so whatever the size of the protein that you want to purify whatever the size uh, is there so let's say my uh, protein of interest is of 60 kilo dalton okay so if it is 60 kilo dalton i cannot use a sephiros 4b column i have to use something where the 60 kilo dalton will be a midpoint of like somewhere in between the fractionation range so i can use a g50 or a g100 or a g200 column okay so that is what 
we mean by the fractionation range and different matrices have different fractionation range. I hope that is clear. Moving on to the next question, question number 8. Which of the following follows a linear relationship in gel filtration chromatography? Elution volume and logarithm of distribution coefficient. Option B, logarithm of elution time and distribution coefficient. Option C, logarithm of molecular weight and distribution coefficient. Option D, elution volume and distribution coefficient. <coughs> okay, we have one answer, option C, logarithm of molecular weight and distribution coefficient, okay. Anyone else wants to answer? Option D, uh, elution volume and distribution coefficient. Okay. <coughs> so the correct answer is actually option C. So I told you the uh, separation is based on size, right? So when we uh, actually do a gel filtration chromatography, we actually plot a calibration curve where we take known molecule. Uh, we take molecules of known molecular weight. So, let us say I took a protein, I know the molecular weight of that protein is 50 kilodalton. I took another protein and now I know the molecular weight of that protein is 70 kilodalton. So, similarly, I will take different molecular weight proteins and I will run it through the gel filtration column. So, what will happen? Different molecular weight will dif elute at a different time. Okay. So, that means different molecular weight proteins will have different different uh, distribution coefficient right so the log of those molecular weight and the distribution coefficient is actually what uh, we plot in the calibration curve to get a linear relation so if i have to show So, we will have something like this. So, different molecular weights, log of different molecular weights will have different points on this linear curve and so we will have here the log the log of molecular weight and here we will have the KD. So, this distribution coefficient is actually replaced by the elution volume or the retention time when we actually do it on the chromatographic system. So, when you will use the FPLC system, there you can act uh, you will see the graph between the log of molecular weight and elution volume. So, elution volume and log of molecular weight is also the correct answer, but elution volume and distribution coefficient are actually not uh, linearly related. So, elution volume will be, uh, uh, how do I say, so distribution coefficient will be based on the elution volume, okay. But the curve that you will plot will be on the y axis you will have the log of molecular weight on the x axis you will either have distribution coefficient or elution volume okay so both elution volume and log of molecular weight they will also have a li linear relationship which is same for kd and log of molecular weight okay is that clear
let's move on to the next question question number 9 dash is used to calculate void volume of freshly packed cefedex 75 column option a ethanol option b blue dextrin option c methylene blue and option d acetone dash is used to calculate the void volume of the freshly packed cefedex 75 column anybody knows the answer option a ethanol option b blue dextrin option c methylene blue and option d acetone option a ethanol okay anyone else wants to answer so the correct answer is actually option b blue dextrin so uh, if you remember in the start only i told you the void volume is basically uh, the spaces between the gel particles right so the largest molecule that cannot enter any of the gel particles will elute out from the void volume so to know the void volume of a particular column so here they have told seven, uh, cefedex 75 column so you have to think of a molecule that is greater than its fractionation uh that that is having the molecular weight higher than its fractionation range so whatever fractionation range cefedex 75 column has so generally blue dextrin col uh, blue dextrin is a very large molecule and it is colored molecule also so what what we do we uh load the blue dextrin onto the gel filtration column and see how much volume of mobile phase is required to elute the blue dextrin so let's say i have a uh, 25 cm or 30 cm long column okay now if i load the blue dextrin and i'm pouring the uh mobile phase buffer i will take the measuring cylinder and check how much volume of mobile phase is required to elute the blue dextrin totally from the column so whatever that volume is if that volume is 4 ml if that volume is 10 ml that particular volume will be the void volume for that column so that means after that void volume only your actual separation is going to start okay in the void volume whatever is eluting in the void volume that means that is not interacting with your uh, stationary phase at all okay so blue dextrin is a large molecule and since it is colored it is easier to monitor through the column if you are doing it manually in the lecture videos also you will see a demonstration where they have actually used blue dextrin to uh, calculate the void volume manually uh, so you can refer that video uh, i think the second video of the of this week lecture is there so check it out and you will understand uh, how blue dextrin is actually used to calculate the void volume okay so whatever volume of mobile phase will be required to elute the blue dextrin completely from this column will be equal into the void volume of that particular column okay clear to everyone moving on to the next question question number 10 which of the following is used for calculating total volume of a gel filtration chromatography column 
so right now we calculated the void volume now they want to ask what can we use to calculate the total volume of the gel filtration chromatography column so option a acetone option b glucose option c starch and option d blue dextrin okay we have one answer option a acetone anyone else wants to answer option a is the correct answer so in the previous question we had we, uh, they asked about the void volume so void volume to calculate the void volume basically we need a large molecule larger than its pore size larger than the matrix pore size so that we can uh, elute it through the void space of the column okay to calculate the total volume we need the smallest molecule possible okay so in a gel filtration system the smallest molecule will be water right but since the mobile phase is also aqueous and the protein will also be in aqueous medium so water molecules are present everywhere so water molecules will be the smallest molecule that will uh, pass through the chromatography column but detection of water molecule will be difficult since the whole system is in water so what we do we generally take a small amount of acetone and we inject it into the column and that acetone will elute at the very end where uh, well, telling us the total volume of the column so acid since acetone is a very small molecule right so acetone will pass through each and every pore uh, that is present in the column so it will take the total column volume length to pass uh to elute out of the column okay so for void volume we wanted a large molecule for total volume we want the smallest molecule possible okay smallest molecule that can be detected okay that's clear okay. moving on to the next question question number 11 which of the following is done to remove precipitated protein from gel filtration chromatography column option a washing column with 20% ethanol option b washing column with buffer option c flowing small volume of protease through the column and option d reverse washing with water reverse washing the column with water which of the following is done to remove precipitated protein from the gel filtration chromatography column anybody wants to answer option a washing column with 20% ethanol option b washing column with buffer option c flowing small volume of protease through the column and option d reverse washing column with water so how can you uh, think of a way to remove the precipitated proteins that are clogging your gel filtration column <clears throat> Nobody wants to answer So the correct answer is option C flowing small volumes of proteases so proteases are 
uh, proteins that can actually chop off other proteins okay proteases are molecules that can chop off uh, different proteins so if there is some precipitated protein that is clogging your gel filtration columns if i pass those protease now what will the protease do protease will chop off these precipitated protein and clean your column okay so proteases are generally used for cleaning column if there is some precipitated protein present in the column other than that washing column with 20% ethanol these are general procedures to clean the column from other uh, particles if not if these process like washing with 20% ethanol or washing with buffer these processes are not cleaning your column and you see that there is some precipitated protein that is actually clogging the column and that is actually affecting the separation of other molecules in that case what we do we take small volume of protease and we run through the column those proteases will go and chop off those precipitated protein into uh, parts of amino acids and then those amino acids will uh, quickly elute out from the column okay so whatever is precipitated and uh, basically jamming your column will get cleared out <coughs> <coughs> the correct answer is option c is that clear i hope that's clear to everyone okay okay moving on to the next question question number 12 which of the following experiment setup is suitable for determining the oligomeric status of the protein option a affinity chromatography followed followed by native phage option b gel filtration chromatography followed by native phage option c gel filtration chromatography followed by sds phage and option d gel filtration chromatography of denatured protein followed by phage which of the following experiment setup is suitable for determining the oligomeric status of the protein so oligomeric status means if the protein is present in monomeric form dimeric form tetrameric form so that so how do we determine the oligomeric status of the protein come on how would you determine you have studied about sds page native page already we are discussing about gel filtration chromatography so how do you think we can uh, separate the uh, we can determine the oligomeric status of a protein so gel filtration chromatography is separating based on size okay we have we got one answer option b gel filtration followed by native page okay anybody else wants to answer seem to get option b as the correct answer okay but option c is actually the correct answer so i'll explain how so uh, till now you have studied that gel filtration chromatography is separating based on size right so uh, let's say you have a dimeric protein of uh, and the monomeric size is 50 kilo dalton okay so now the protein is in dimer form that means 50 50 it becomes 100 kilo dalton so when we are separating from gel filtration chromatography it is actually eluting uh, it is actually giving the 100 kilo dalton molecular weight now what we'll do we will run it on sds page now if you remember from the previous sessions sds page basically 
denatures the protein completely so uh, separates all the dimers into monomers so sds in sds page you will get the monomeric molecular weight okay so in sds page if i am getting the molecular weight as 50 kilodalton and in gel filtration chromatography i am getting a peak of 100 kilodalton that means there are two monomers of 50 kilodalton that are forming a homodimer okay <coughs> so gel filtration followed by sds page can actually help us give the actual oligomeric status of the protein so it's not necessary that it will be a homodimer there can be heterodimer heterodimeric examples also so let's say you have a uh, gel filtration in the gel filtration chromatography column you got a peak at 150 kilodalton okay and on when i'm running the same protein on sds page i'm getting two bands one at 50 kilodalton one at 100 kilodalton that means we have two different monomers of different sizes that are actually interacting together to form a heterodimer okay <coughs> or if i if instead of two bands on sds page if i if i would have gotten only one band at 50 kilodalton that means it is a trimer of 50 kilodalton three units of 50 kilodalton interacting together to make a 150 kilodalton protein okay <coughs> so native page will actually be very similar to gel filtration chromatography because we are not denaturing the protein so the movement will be based on the whole size of the protein so if you do native page and sds page simultaneously you can actually get the uh you can actually get the oligomeric status of the protein which we actually discussed in the elect electrophoresis uh, session <coughs> so here after gel filtration if you do sds page you can act easily get the uh, oligomeric status of the protein is that clear to everyone any doubt in this question Is this question clear to everyone? Okay. Okay. Moving on to the next question, question number thirteen. A protein X from mycobacterium tuberculosis H three seven R V is treated with three molar urea. What will be the resultant effect on the gel filtration chromatography of urea? treated protein x with respect to the untreated protein x okay we have treated a protein with 3 molar urea and then we have done the gel filtration chromatography so what would be the resultant effect on the urea treated protein with respect to the untreated protein option a urea treated protein x will elute after untreated protein x option b urea treated protein x and untreated protein x will elute at the same time option c urea treated protein x will elute before the untreated protein x and option d peak of urea treated protein x will be better resolved than the peak of untreated protein x so what would be the correct answer Okay, we have one answer, option C. Anyone else wants to answer?
okay the correct answer is actually option c so you are right so what is happening basically when we are adding urea the protein will get unfolded right so you remember i told you about the hydrodynamic radius so two proteins having the same molecular weight based on the hydrodynamic radius one will elute first one will elute later why because if something is more compactly packed that will have a smaller radius thus it will elute later okay so what is happening we are adding urea urea is unfolding the protein resulting in increase in the hydrodynamic radius so if i give you a paper ball and i ask you to slowly unfold it into the paper you will see the paper ball was occupying lesser space than the whole paper itself right so that radius of that molecule is increasing when urea is added and till now you have understood that gel filtration chromatography in gel filtration chromatography basically the larger molecules are eluting first and the smaller molecules are eluting last okay so if something is unfolding that means it is getting bigger in size that means it will elute first and the untreated protein will elute last so that's why urea treated protein will elute before the untreated protein because now the urea treated protein has a higher hydrodynamic radius than the untreated protein is this clear if there is any doubt you can ask so higher the amount of urea you will see the uh, peaks will keep on shifting so if you have a protein and then you treat it with one molar urea you will have a peak that will be before the untreated protein then you have the same protein treated with two molar urea two molar peak will be even before the one molar peak that is two molar protein treated with two molar urea will elute before the protein treated with one molar urea and then at the end you will get the untreated protein eluted out of the column okay so amount of unfolding will increase the hydrodynamic radius and thus it will shift its elution time accordingly is that clear to everyone let's move on to the next question now question number 14 when a protein is subjected to very high concentration of denaturant that is more than 8 molar urea which of the following is true option a it will mostly appear in the pore volume option b it will mostly appear in the void volume option c it will get adsorbed on the beads and option d it will elute after the native protein so it is a similar question to the previous one so you should be able to answer so i told you what was happening with urea treatment the protein was unfolding and thus the hydrodynamic radius was increasing now in this question we are subjecting that protein to a very high concentration of urea so, <coughs> so what will happen <coughs> okay we have one answer option b it will mostly appear in the void volume anyone else wants to answer come on this is not a very difficult question we just discussed about it <coughs> yeah option b so we have two people agreeing on option b that is the correct answer it will mostly appear in the void volume why because as i told you when we are treating a protein with urea what we are doing we are increasing its hydrodynamic radius thus we can say in a manner uh, in a way we are increasing its size since the size has increased if the size has increased 
uh, exceeded the fractionation range what will happen the protein will not be able to enter the pore at all and it will elute in the void volume itself so when we are subjecting the protein to a very high concentration of urea basically the protein has unfolded uh, to a lim uh, to a point where it has exceeded the fractionation range so now the protein is higher than the the size of the protein is higher than the pore si uh, size of the pore and thus the protein will elute in the void volume so it will elute first and it will mostly elute in the void volume because it cannot enter the pore at all because it has exceeded the pore size okay i hope this is clear to everyone <coughs> anybody have any doubt Moving on to the next question, a protein was incubated with a suitable ligand and the res uh, resultant uh, sample was analyzed using gel filtration chromatography. Chromatogram resulted in single peak, which uh, what is, uh, sorry, what can be the correct reason for that? A protein was incubated with a suitable ligand and the resultant sample was analyzed using gel filtration chromatography. The chromatogram resulted in a single peak. So, what what can be the reason for that uh, for this phenomenon? Option A: All the ligand was bound to the protein. Option B: Protein was denatured. Option C: Protein precipitated in the column. And option D: Protein was adsorbed on the bead. what would be the correct answer anybody wants to answer i have a protein and a ligand and i have incubated both of them together and now when i'm analyzing on the gel filtration chromatography i just got one peak what does it mean i had two different molecules i had the protein and i had the ligand so instead of getting two separate peaks i got only one peak then what does it mean Yeah, option A, all the ligand was bound to the protein. That's why, right. since all the ligand was bound to the protein, now I have a single entity, protein ligand complex. So, that's why I just got single peak on the gel filtration chromatography. Okay. So, do you understand how we are getting single peak? Because all the ligand that was there was bound to the protein. So, there is no free ligand that we will get a ligand peak. There is no free protein that we will get a separate protein peak. If there was some free ligand of free protein left, we would have gotten a separate peak after the protein ligand complex. Because obviously the protein ligand complex is going to be the larger molecule. So, that will elute first. Then the free protein and probably then the free ligand. Okay. But we are getting only one peak. That means all the ligands are bound to the protein. All other three options, protein was denatured, protein precipitated in the column and adsorbed on the beads. In all these three cases, we wouldn't have gotten any peak. If protein was denatured, it won't, probably it will uh, precipitate in the column or it won't be detected by the 
detector so it will not be uh, visible as a peak in the chromatogram for same for precipitation if protein has precipitated it will not elute out of the column and if the protein is adsorbed by the beads again it will not elute out of the column so the only answer that is correct here is option a okay so you all were correct so option a is the right answer moving on to the next question question number 16 For a gel filtration chromatography of proteins, which of the following is true? Option A: Large or elongated proteins enter the pores in the bead. Small proteins enter the pores in the bead. Large or elongated protein elute from the bottom of the column later. Small proteins elute from the bo bottom of the column first. So, what would be the correct answer? Okay, we have one answer. Option D: Small proteins enter the pores in the bead. Okay. Okay, we have one more answer as option B. Anyone else? So all of you seem to agree with option B being the correct answer. So that is the correct answer. Small proteins enter the pores in the bead. So large and elongated proteins will basically either enter some of the pores or won't enter the pore and will elute from the void volume small proteins will enter the pores in the bead because they are small they can fit in the pore size so they will enter the pore large or elongated protein will elute first elute from the bottom of the column first and small proteins will elute last so both c and d options are incorrect option a is incorrect so option b is the correct answer small proteins will enter the pores in the bead okay so this is i hope clear by uh, we have been discussing this in the whole class so i hope this concept is clear to everyone any doubt in this question or till this point so we'll move to the next question now question number 17 you are given a sample containing a mixture of proteins of varying molecular weights following are the steps involved in performing gel filtration chromatography to separate these proteins so we have the steps different steps uh, given pack the column q is analyze the fraction r is apply the sample and S is elute the protein. What would be the correct order of steps when you are performing gel filtration chromatography? What should be the order that you should follow? Pack the column, analyze the fraction, apply the sample, and elute the protein. What would be the correct answer? Okay, we have two people answering option D. That is, first we need to pack the column, then. r that is apply the sample elute the protein and then analyze the fraction yes that is the correct answer so we will first have to pack the column that is i hope clear to everyone then first you have a column packed we will load the sample apply the sample the sample will pass through the column separate based on their sizes we will take the fractions that is elute the protein so we will take different fractions as the elution all those fractions will then be analyzed on sds page or we will do brat uh, like protein estimation so whatever technique you want to do to analyze the fraction then we will analyze each and every fraction to see where my protein of interest is and then we will pool all those fractions where my protein of interest will be there and then i can use that purified protein for further an analysis okay so that is a common uh, procedure how we purify protein from a mixture okay so this is clear to everyone i hope moving 
on to the next question question number 18 you are performing gel filtration chromatography to separate proteins of different sizes which of the following factors would most likely affect the resolution of separation option a concentration of the sample option b flow rate of uh, the buffer option c the ph of the buffer and option d temperature of the column so which of the following factor will affect the resolution of separation anybody wants to answer option a concentration of the sample option b flow rate of the buffer option c ph of the buffer and option d temperature of the column okay we have one answer as option a and two answer one okay option a option b option a okay so what do you mean by resolution first let's understand that so in the previous session also i think we have discussed about resolution so resolution basically means the distance between two peaks so how well you can separate two molecules so if i have two molecules of very uh, small size difference and if your column is able to separate that that means it is having a good resolution like in very simple uh, language if i say like i have two different columns one column is able to separate proteins that are uh, different by 2 kilo dalton size and one column is able to separate protein only when the proteins are different by 10 kilo dalton size that means the column that is able to separate the proteins that are uh, different by 2 kilo dalton is having a good is having a better resolution than the other column okay so the smallest distance possible between two peaks like how well you can separate two different proteins in a chromatography column will be its resolution okay so now for this question actually the correct answer is option b flow rate in gel filtration chromatography is a very important parameter so whenever you are doing gel filtration chromatography you know it's uh filtration based technique like things are entering into the pore and eluting out of the column okay now if you give a very high flow rate the molecules will not get enough time to enter the pores and then travel through the column so we you, you won't get a very good separation if the slower the flow rate will be actually better resolution you can get so what will happen if you have a low flow rate and you have a thin tall column what will happen the molecules different molecules will get enough time to separate from each other okay so uh even if you have a very concentrated sample with mixture of 5 or 10 proteins in it of different sizes those 5 10 proteins need enough time to separate throughout the length of the column so that when you are eluting the fractions you will get each protein in each fraction and there won't be any overlap of two proteins okay like if i have a mixture of pro four proteins a b c and d i want a b c and d in separate vials i don't want mixture of a and b or c and d in any of the vials so for that i need to give enough time for a b c and d to separate throughout the column so if i have a slow flow rate and a th uh, tall column i will give them enough space to get separated okay so that is the most important factor that will affect your resolution so flow rate is actually a very important parameter when you are doing gel filtration chromatography okay concentration of sample will also affect the resolution but it is not the so here in the question uh, it says most likely affects the resolution so flow rate will most likely affect the resolution after that if i need to choose a second factor that will be concentration so whenever you are doing gel filtration chromatography and let's say you are not getting 
desired peaks and you want to troubleshoot what is wrong what is going wrong in the process first you should actually see if your flow rate is proper or not if the flow rate is no if the flow rate is too high you won't get well separated peaks okay then second thing the concentration of the sample if the concentration of sample is also too high you will basically overload the column so it's like i need to uh, strain a uh, t using a normal strainer or sieve that we use at home right but now if i have very large volume of t and i have a very small <coughs> strainer and if i pour the whole volume of t through the strainer at once obviously the t is going to spill out of the strainer it is not going to go through the strainer at once so that's why overloading this column is also not a good uh, idea because that is also going to affect the resolution but the most important factor that can affect the resolution is your flow rate <coughs> ph is not a very important factor in uh, size exclusion chromatography it is only important to select the ph in which your protein is stable so as i have mentioned that protein should not precipitate inside the column right so uh if you have a ph uh, of the mobile phase buffer in which your protein is not stable and it is it can get precipitated in that particular ph then you should avoid that particular ph okay so you should take uh you should select the ph of the buffer based on your protein stability that is the only role of ph in case of size exclusion in case of ion exchange or any charge based separation ph has a major role but in case of size based separation ph is only important for maintaining the stability of your molecule same goes for temperature if your protein is not stable at room temperatures you should always perform the chromatography in a uh, cold room or uh, in a in inside a refrigerated system okay so that your protein molecule does not precipitate while getting separated so in between when you are separating in the column in between if the protein gets denatured or separated and ultimately you won't get the desired protein uh, uh, any protein purification whenever you are doing a protein purification the me main goal is to achieve a pure active native form of the protein so if you get a denatured protein at the end it's not gonna be of any use so ph and temperature is basically important for maintaining the stability of your molecule flow rate is very important for resolution concentration is also important for resolution but first you have to maintain the flow rate and then you have to troubleshoot for concentration okay so i hope this is clear moving on to the next question question number 19 which of the following is a common method for determining the molecular weight of a protein using gel filtration chromatography option a bradford assay option b sds page option c gel filtration calibration curve and option d isoelectric focusing so what can we use to determine the molecular weight i have already told you the answer in one of the previous questions so let's say i have a gel filtration chromatography column and i am uh, separating my molecule now i want to know the molecular weight of the protein so what will i do bradford assay sds page gel filtration calibration curve or isoelectric focusing okay we have two answers as option c one answer as option b yes the correct answer is option c gel filtration calibration curve that is basically the curve between the logarithmic of molecular weight and the elution volume so log of molecular weight and elution volume 
okay so we will have a curve from the known proteins and wherever my uh, protein of interest is eluting whatever the elution volume my protein of interest will elute from this calibration curve from this calibration curve i can actually determine the molecular weight of that of my protein of interest okay so this is a calibration curve why we can't use sds page so if you remember the uh, question about oligomeric status in sds page we will only get the monomeric uh, size right so if a protein is dimer or tetramer the exact molecular weight of that whole dimer or tetramer we will get from this calibration curve so when we are doing gel filtration chromatography when we are performing gel filtration chromatography uh, we will find the molecular weight of the molecule from this gel uh, from this calibration curve let's say i found the molecular weight to be 100 kilo dalton then i can move on to analyze it on sds page on sds page also if i get 100 kilo dalton band that means it is a monomer of 100 kilo dalton if i get band at 50 kilo dalton that means it is a dimer of uh, 50 kilo dalton okay so that's why sds page is not the first choice to determine the molecular weight because it will only give us the molecular uh, it will only give us the monomeric uh, weight for knowing the exact weight of the whole protein so whole protein can be in dimer form if it if the protein is in dimer form we will consider the molecular weight of the protein in that dimeric form only so to know the exact molecular weight we need a calibration curve done on that same gel filtration column so whenever you are doing the uh, whenever you are analyzing your sample first you have to do this calibration curve so you have to take either you can take mixture of known uh, proteins or you can load one protein after the other of known molecular weight <coughs> get the elution volume for each protein plot the curve then in the same uh, like in the same system only load your own like load the unknown sample get the elution volume and from the curve you can actually get the molecular weight okay i hope that's clear bradford assay is actually used to do uh, used to estimate the protein concentration okay so correct answer is option c this is uh, clear to everyone okay, moving on to the next question question number 20 you want to remove salts from a protein solution using gel filtration chromatography which type of gel matrix would be most suitable cephedex g10 g75 g200 or cl6b <coughs> so basically you want to do desalting using a gel filtration chromatography so gel filtration can actually be used for protein purification as well as desalting okay removal of salts from the protein so which of the mat following matrix can be used for such purpose if you remember the fractionation range so the correct answer actually is option a cephedex g10 so if you remember from the fractionation range g10 is the small g10 had the smallest fractionation range like fractionation range in the lower uh, molecular size uh, values right so salt molecule will be very small like the difference between the protein size and the salt molecule size will be diff very uh, big right so protein will be a very large molecule as compared to the salt uh, one molecule of salt right so to separate the salt from the uh, protein we can actually use the g10 column where when you load the protein the protein will elute in from the void volume itself and 
the salt will be separated out of the protein so those these columns are called desalting columns they can like small versions of these columns are uh, purchased from the like they are available in the market and you can directly load your protein and elute the fractions in different uh, vials and then analyze in which of the vial you have your protein fraction okay this is the desalting process i hope that's clear okay moving on to the last question of the session is question number 21 from the gel filtration column chromatography which two of the following has a linear relationship so we have discussed this previously first is amount of protein second is relative elution volume of the protein and third is logarithmic of the protein molecular mass so which two of them have the linear relationship come on you should be able to answer this question we just discussed about the calibration curve right okay we have one answer option c 1 and 3 amount of protein and log of protein molecular weight okay anyone else <coughs> if you remember the calibration curve i just drew what was the x axis and y axis come on i just made the calibration curve yeah okay we have one answer as option b relative elution volume and the log of protein mass yes that is the correct answer so if you remember here yeah so we have log of molecular weight and the elution volume they have the linear relationship and that's how we get the calibration curve so correct answer is option b okay so with this we come to the end of the session so if you have any doubt in any of the quest previous questions or regarding gel filtration chromatography you can ask now anyone wants to ask any question or do you want me to uh revisit any of the questions discussed today <coughs> everything was clear in this session if there is no doubt then i think we can end this session okay so thank you all for joining if you have any question we can discuss it in the next session also so we will i'll see you all next tuesday okay so yeah thank you thank you for joining thank you ma'am yeah.